Hi, Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. I want to uh, uh, appreciate uh, these guys showing up on a rare Wednesday show. This is about the time when I'm starting to say, you know, that last show wasn't bad. You know, and then I've got three days to prepare. Well, guess what? I have no days to prepare. Luckily, something happened today, right, Dan Farber? Oh, many things happened today. We had uh, earnings from Apple and Facebook. We had the uh, net neutrality, some notion that there might be some speed bumps in net, in net neutrality. So uh, an interesting day overall. Okay, excellent. Uh, also joining us is uh, Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Nice to hear you, Steve. I've got a huge echo, by the way, of you uh, right now. Uh, and initially, just then, I could hear myself. I came back, but that's gone. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still uh, hearing an echo as well. No, that's not good. How's that? S still there. It's like you're Testing. Elvis Presley. Well, that's good. John Lennon wouldn't record without this echo. It's like, bebop, loobop, she's my baby. Sounds like that, but with an echo. <laughs> okay, how about now? Better, gone. Okay, excellent. Uh, it's the uh, fallback loop, Tina. Just next time. And, uh, and we also heard from Robert Scoble. Welcome, Robert. What's up? Uh, I see you survived... Uh, Coachella. Uh, yeah, that. <laughs> so who was that to Coachella this year? Uh, the big act was Skrillex, probably. That, that was the hottest thing. Although as, as some people think it was Outkast. But uh, to me, uh, Skr Skrillex had the pressure to get mm. into his act. And, uh, you mean he, had, um, he was under pressure to actually do something that's no, every music? No, you know, Coachella attracts a lot of 20-year-olds, and they want to see uh, Skrillex and Slim Boy, uh, Fat Boy Slim and uh, Empire of the Sun, the newer acts that are doing more electronic uh, music in the tent, the EDM tent, which has this unbelievable LED light system that just shreds your brain if you, if you stare at it too long. Okay, but there wasn't anything actually resembling real music there, right? Oh, there was, but, you know, nobody wants to see that anymore. Brian Ferry was there. Really? I saw yeah. Brian Ferry. He was plenty fine, but he wasn't Skrillex. Well, I think that was good for him, right? Uh, he didn't have very much of a crowd. I could get in and take pictures of him. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Well, more for us. Uh, so, uh, Outcast was this the original Andre two thousand plus the other guy? Yeah, but no, you know their set was was just not uh, as interesting as uh, the stuff that was going on in the uh, EDM tent. Didn't isn't he starring in a in a biopic of uh, Hendrix? Uh, Andre two thousand. Yeah, I think I, so. The, my favorite acts were um, uh, rudimentary, rudimental. I'm sorry. They were unbelievable. Um, and uh, who does the Pumped Up Kicks song? Uh, Foster the People was very good. And uh, Cage the Elephant was extraordinary. So there, there were some other, other non-electronic music that was uh, worth seeing. But um, I don't know. I, I stayed in the uh, party tent the whole time. Okay. So... Uh Dan Farber, let's uh, start with uh, the let's start with Facebook, and then we'll go to Apple. Okay. Well, Facebook had a a very nice a very nice quarter. Kind of they blew past expectations and showing a lot of growth. And I think fifty nine percent of their of their advertising revenue came from mobile. Um, their I think uh, monthly average users is now around uh, or daily average users I think is over eight hundred million. So. All in all, they are showing that they have staying power. Yep. You know, I, I, I had a lunch today with a, somebody I can't name, but one of the things we talked about is the fact that a lot of that revenue, I mean, a lot with a capital L, is coming from app installs on mobile. The, the, the app install ad unit that lets an app a developer advertise to install their app, and if you click it, you go straight to the app store and you're installing it. That's the one that's driving all that revenue. And they also have a an ad network coming. Um, they acknowledge that it is coming. They didn't say much more about it, but um, 
you know, the first quarter revenue from advertising was 2.27 billion. So that's kind of like um, Google numbers when you really think about it. When Google is at this stage, and what uh, what stage is that? Well, it's a stage where the company is proving its 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 revenue model, that it it could it could migrate to mobile and that it can extract revenue from mobile. Um, and 1.34 billion came from mobile of that of that advertising revenue. So you have a company that pretty much you know owns a huge part of the market in terms of uh, time spent on the internet, and they're converting that into you know basically around two dollars per person. And I think their revenue in the U.S. and Canada was was up you know like 80 percent. So but I was going to. This is a company like Google that, you know, has an outsized market share and is capitalizing on it. I was going to ask, Dan, how do you think about this compared to the Google earnings call? On the Google earnings call, they also showed quite a bit of growth on mobile, except the CPCs on mobile were dramatically lower, like only 20% of the same CPCs on desktop. So as um, and the desktop was still growing, luckily, so their overall revenue grew, but their CPC declined. And analysts are saying that, you know, as Google loses desktop traffic and mobile traffic takes up a greater share of it, their absolute revenues might decline. Whereas with Facebook, because they have no legacy to compare it with, so they're not losing anything in the growth of mobile, it's all upside. So do you think that Facebook is the play in mobile advertising, or do you think Google has a hope of, um, transitioning in such a way that their revenue grows, not declines. That's well, what they, they're, they they're, say. They're very complementary. In the case of Google, they're targeting what your searches are. So they have a lot of data with which to provide you with something that's more likely to get clicks. In the case of Facebook, they're targeting based on algorithms and what they know about you. So both of them work together very well. And in fact, you could say that between Google and Facebook, they're soaking up most of the mobile ad revenue. Except uh, this is true for me, and I think it's now proven to be true that people search a lot less on mobile because of the app centric nature of mobile. Yes, yes, that's definitely the case. But then again, you know, Google has a good position in mobile on that, and unless they get kicked off of the iPhone, uh, you know, they're still going to have a very good business on that. And uh, but I also think it means that Google needs to really think harder about its diversification and how to really push Google now harder. Um, be interesting to see Microsoft because Microsoft with Cortana, it's it's um, digital personal assistant, and uh, you know trying to get more traction. Uh, you know whether in four or five years they can actually have more of a play. So I'm I, I'm um, it's interesting. You know if you look at the uh, the IAB announced uh, mobile ad figures. I think it was last week, and if you look at the pie of um, all internet advertising. I think mobile represents about 10% now, roughly. Um, and um, the question is, does the pie shrink as mobile's share grows? You're talking about gross revenues. Gro gross advertising spend, yeah. The, the, uh, as it becomes less and less attractive to advertise on the desktop, which it will if people aren't engaged with the desktop that much, does the transition to mobile result in... Uh, not because of the lack of money, but lack of ways to spend it well. Um, does it? And, and there's a lot of bets being placed that this is true. Uh, for example, yeah. there's, a lot, there's a lot of new startups doing what's called native advertising on mobile. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think I think what what's going to happen is that the the CPMs or the you know the cost for mobile ads will have to go up as the companies providing them or providing the platforms like a Facebook or a Google or Apple, whatever, as they get better at targeting, because it's all about the return on the investment. So if I get more clicks, if I get a, a, a better customer out of that click, you know, you're going to pay more. So if it's just flooding um, mobile devices with ads, that's just not going to work. It doesn't scale very well because the CPMs are so low. So low. Uh, so it's all about finding the right person at the right time. But so are those that, are those ads actually working uh, uh, on the uh, web? 
you know, you know, the flooded ad model, does that really work? Well, I think it, it works, um, you know, in terms of a couple of ways. One, it can work if you, you have an audience and you're, you know, and it's more customized and tailored to the certain kinds of information so you can target better. But the kind of, of sites where, you know, it's a flood of ads and the CPMs are like $2 or $3. I mean, that doesn't work. It only works when you have like a, a basically a content farm, very little cost and high volume. But that's not a great user experience. So I think that um, the, especially on mobile, it's all going to be about how do you integrate it into the mobile experience. And I know that Zuckerberg talked about that today, that they need to make their ads, whether it's on mobile or desktop, a, you know, a great user experience so that you can't tell the difference between you know, traditional content and the advertising that you're getting. It's just so seamlessly part of your life. I think that's a hard trick to pull off. Because if you look at the model of, of television, now, definitely television is much more of a broadcast rather than a targeted model, but people can't wait to skip the ads. So... How do you create ads on mobile, which is an inherently more difficult device to get a message across? How do you create ads that will have that kind of sticking power? Or do people start moving to more subscription-based models in combination? Right, and bundling the results as, uh, as well. I mean, there was an interesting deal today. Uh, Amazon uh, paid about $300 million for access to uh, HBO programming uh, for their Fire. Yes, except you have to remember that that um, those programs are at least three years old. So yeah, got but it's not all. It's not it. just those though. They're also uh, going to put uh, HBO to go on. Uh, well, that's already on that device. It's not on. Already. Well, but it, it's on Apple's device. But yeah. those, you know, the old programs, three years old, are going to be free to Prime members. Yeah, uh, I. All I'm saying is, is that uh, the the that buy that deal brings them up to the parity with uh, Apple TV that uh, that they need to do. It also uh, makes them a much more serious challenger to uh, to Netflix. Well, if, if they're going to be a challenger to Apple TV, I mean, Apple TV, uh, Tim Cook announced today on the, on the earnings call that... Oh, but we're going into the Apple thing. I'll uh, just give you one little data point mm -hmm. that Apple has sold 20 million Apple TVs. So it's no longer just a little hobby. Yeah, and it's not as not only is it not a hobby, but uh, it's responsible for over a billion in revenue because of what they are buying on Apple TV as well. Yes, like content, right? Uh, Robert Scoble, uh, uh, do you care about any of this? You look I, like you're still recovering. I'm still recovering from uh, Coachella. Yeah, I I am. I'm I'm interested in it because uh, it shows that a Apple's continuing its uh, very profitable ways, and nothing has slowed it down. And uh, same thing for Facebook. I, you know, it's interesting that I made a bet on Facebook a couple of years ago before most of the other journalists uh, took it very seriously, and I went from thirteen thousand followers to well, fake six hundred thousand followers because they include all the followers that I get off a list, but uh, real two hundred forty thousand followers. And Twitter in that time has uh, remained flat in growth. And um, that I'm interested in is what is Twitter going to do to to restart growth and grow faster than Facebook is growing? Because Twitter should be growing faster than Facebook at this point because they have fewer users. Uh, uh, Facebook should be uh, hitting walls of growth because uh, they have one point whatever two million people billion people on Facebook, and it's going to be harder for Facebook to find new people to join Facebook, right? But Facebook continues to grow, and the, and the traffic numbers that Facebook is kicking off continue to grow faster than Twitter, and and that that's something I'm watching very closely. Keith, do you agree with that? That uh, Twitter's got a problem. Well, if I take Robert's statement that Twitter should be growing faster than Facebook because it's smaller. I think on the face of it, that's true. But Twitter has a less promising platform for growth because it made a decision to focus on being um, primarily a content portal 
rather than a social network. It really doesn't have very much engagement tools. It's got, it does have direct messaging and it has retweeting and favoriting. But those are very low engagement things. Direct messaging, you don't do much. Favoriting, you don't do much. Retweeting, you do when you're involved in it in some way or it grabs you in some way, but it's not that often. Compared to Facebook, which has many more tools for engagement and reasons to go back regularly. So I, I think that what Twitter hasn't figured out is how to make the interest graph engaging. And that's really all about people you don't know that you share things in common with at the level of interests. Yeah. It, sh it should be very engaging, but they're, they're, they're on this path of copying Facebook now, and I think they're losing their uniqueness and their originality. They're also vastly undervaluing their platform. Um, and by and by cutting off, you know, buying your nip, cutting off other clients, throttling them, they they didn't understand that uh, traffic is the source of all good. They, they they basically thought that engagement was more important than traffic, and it isn't. Uh, unless you've got traffic, then it becomes more important. Okay, but, well, this is what I'd like to kind of tease out because this uh, relates to what Dan was talking about just before. And what I was trying to ask in my own uh, stumbling way was, uh, isn't the the ad space uh, going to be uh, become uh, irrevocably changed by the sophistication with which digital technologies allow you to know much more about who uh, is viewing, uh, interacting with uh, information? In other words, isn't it really removing the value proposition of the web uh, as a as a you know click medium, uh, a URL driven uh, uh, environment when you don't really know much about? It's more of a, a traditional web uh, or a TV model that Dan was talking about. Does that make any sense to anybody? No, no, I don't. I, I don't. Well. Maybe it's just a language thing, and I, I think I use different words as I think about this, but maybe start with a scenario. Let's say I walk into Stanford Shopping Mall Macy's with my iPhone, with Twitter running. Macy's, A, don't even know I'm in the store, B, don't know I'm running Twitter, and, and C, don't know who I am. All of that's going to change in the next 12 months. They're going to know I'm in the store. They're going to know I'm running Twitter. They still won't know who I am, but they can target something at me in the app that I'm currently running. And the way that's all going to work is to do with iBeacons. And if I say any more, I'm going to be giving away how to do that. And well, how many weeks do we have to go before you can say what you were actually saying? Probably about... You said somewhere. a week ago, a week ago. Uh, uh, actually, it was five days ago. So if we were doing this on Friday, would you be able to talk about it? Oh, that's something else. Oh. Um, uh, that's something else. Um, there's two things. Uh, the, the, I can talk about the thing I, a week ago, but that's something else. This is a, all to do with beacons and context. And there will be a way, ultimately, of um, universalizing... Uh, both people and things uh, to a layer of, you know, resolution that doesn't exist today. And um, but before we get to the, you know, the brave new world, I mean, isn't already uh, the amount of information that, uh, I mean, you know, for example, uh, uh, Exact Target has uh, this uh, journey that uh, the people where they're tracking. Uh, you know, what is going on uh, from the moment that a campaign begins to the moment that the user comes back and asks a customer service question about the product after they bought it. I mean, there's already a tremendous amount. Just the feedback loop of social uh, changes the equation uh, dramatically. Well, except, th think of it this way. We're currently living in a digital world and we're also living in the real world. And right now, they don't fit together very well. That's about to change. The, the real world will become, um, I guess, ambient is the world that everyone uses. But what yeah. that means, that, but that's a two-way thing. 
you will be, you will, if you choose, be viewable or knowable in the real world. And the, the context of where you are, what digital things you're running and what physical place you're in will start to come together to yep. create experiences that don't currently exist. And it already happen. is. Uh, at Coachella, they had signs throughout the field where you tapped your armband and it automatically checked you into Facebook and shared with your friends that you're seeing uh, like Skrillex. Um, and there were beacons. Now, the beacons were not, uh, did not seem to be turned on. And if they had been, it, it really had not done a, they hadn't done the app work yet to really uh, do something innovative there. I also visited the Sacramento Kings and they just turned on 35 beacons in their basketball stadium but they have not yet uh, finished the, the software for the apps that would change uh, uh, what, what happens to you as you walk around the stadium. But they, they've done a few tests. They did a little um, uh, contest. So they said if you uh, walk around the stadium, you'll find a geocached uh, uh, prize and somebody will uh, uh, you know, open their iPhone and get a couple of tickets to uh, the, the home opener next year or something like that. But they're really thinking through um, how, how to use uh, the, this, I don't even know the right word, but lo location uh, or, or presence uh, info to do new experiences for the fans. But that's already um, happening. And that's going to be fun to watch. It, it is going to be exciting when it, it occurs. Also, it's going to be enraging for a lot of uh, people uh, uh, who aren't as thrilled with uh, the steady march of technology. But uh, what I was trying to get at is that already, I mean, like, for example, Foursquare, uh, I go uh, I go to this uh, breakfast place, and uh, first of all, it tells me that I'm already there, and it gives me some tips from people, notably my wife, who's sitting next to me, but uh, telling me, you know, to uh, that the pancakes are great, or whatever it is. Uh, then they they you know bootstrap this this has been very insistent they have this auto check-in thing now which yeah. uh and they ask you the question or they ask me the question uh why would you like to have tina auto check you in here and of course being the couch potato that i am of course i would much rather do something without actually having to do anything so i say yes and they point out that that means that every one of the people that uh, sees you uh, now has the ability to check you in at a location and that you can always go and turn it off. I, but I'm not going to turn it off because I didn't turn it on. What One of the cool new features that Facebook just turned on last weekend for me, and it's still not on for my wife, so I, you might not uh, be able to see this, is the uh, nearby uh, friends feature. And this shows you uh, who is close to you, who is online right now on Facebook. And I like this feature a lot. But, and let's go through this feature. First of all, uh, if you have it, it, you have to touch the lower right uh, button uh, on the Facebook app down here. And you'll see uh, a, a new uh, field called Nearby Friends. And then you can decide whether to turn this thing on. Uh, and also who can see uh, your presence information. Uh, you can make it so that only your family can see it or only your close friends or only your friends or nobody. Um, or uh, And I think you can even um, uh, set it so that you can uh, uh, say friends except for acquaintances and other, other groups. So you, you can play around with that. I find this feature very, very cool and very fascinating. It doesn't show you really where you are, but it shows you that you're nearby. And, so and, now and I can this message is... you and say, hey, Steve, I see you're uh, at the nearby, which means you're probably at the Ritz or at Cameron's. Um, would you like to meet? Can I meet you for a, a drink? And and then, you know, if, if you do, you say, yeah, yeah, come on down. Um, so it's, it's, it's done carefully enough to... Uh, not make it possible to stalk somebody, but this is really, really neat, neat feature that's coming and it's turning on for people this week. And I and uh, there's a guy named Josh Miller who I haven't actually met yet, but uh, John Borthwick uh, has been encouraging me to uh, uh, bring in some uh, people to the show, like uh, Samil Shaw, who's been fantastic. And Josh wrote this great article 
which of course was all about something that we talked about last week, namely the uh, uh, the lock screen. Uh, he, he talked about three things that were really going to be important in the near future, and the first of them was the lock screen. Yeah, and uh, of course he's right since it was my idea. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is is that one of the things the points that he references about why this is going to be important and that it's going to happen very quickly is the number of people who uh, are active and respond to notifications is far greater. The percentage of people who, if they click on a notification, they will, in fact, uh, you know, engage uh, is far greater than a web page or other kinds of mobile apps. So we've got this, uh, you know, what you just said, Robert, about the nearby friends engages people uh, with their assent, and it also encourages harvesting of their social graph yeah. in a way that is exceptionally more sticky to Dan's original point. I, I also noticed Facebook is showing me information uh, based on my location. Uh, when I was at Coachella, I saw lots of other people's posts from Coachella, and I'm sure you, you in San Francisco weren't seeing that many. Uh, when I came back to San Francisco, I saw uh, KTVU News uh, info about a fire, and um, I'm sure that if you're in New York, you were not seeing that post about that fire because it, it doesn't really matter to you. And their algorithms on the news feed are getting smarter and smarter based on location. This is why you should not turn off the location ability for, or, or the, the Facebook's ability to use location uh, because it really does affect the quality of Facebook and also affects the ability to use these newer features, uh, which you can turn off inside the app, not, not globally uh, in the privacy settings of your phone. Dan, so, you want to comment on this? 